My job is to read books. That's one of the perks of being a writer is that you can't write without reading. Stokes would say also though, you can't be wise, you can't have a good life if you don't read from the greatest works ever written. Seneca says that only those who make time for philosophy are truly alive. He said they annex all the wisdom of the past into their own life. That's why I like reading. I like learning from the experiences of others. And I've been reading every day for as long as I've been able to read. And that's what's made me successful. It's also made me happy. It's made me a better human being. That culminated in a couple years ago, I opened my own bookstore. I'm Ryan Holiday. I've written about Stoic philosophy now for almost 15 years. Talked about it everywhere from the NBA to the NFL, special forces, sitting senators. In today's episode, I wanna to talk to you about some of my favorite books, books that have changed my life, books that I think you absolutely need to read and that will make you healthier, wealthier, wiser, and many, many other things. Let's get into it. This is a book that you can tell when I read it for the first time, I was struck by a few things. This is written by one of the most famous Romans of all time. He's near the end of his life. He was the advisor to the emperor. He probably knows that he's a marked man, that the emperor is soon going to kill him. He's been studying philosophy his whole life. And he has this friend who's in a prominent position of power as a governor of a Roman province. He wants to write some advice to that guy. They have this exchange back and forth where they're writing these letters to each other about life, about the world, the things we struggle with, where to find peace, how to avoid the traps that other people fall into. I'm talking about Seneca. This is not actually what Seneca looked like, long story, but Seneca writes these letters to his friend Lucilius. And I think it's one of the most incredible books written about success, about failure, about learning. Ultimately, he defines philosophy. I think this is great. He says, how do you know you're making progress with this philosophy? I know because I've begun to be a better friend to myself. So read Seneca's letters. It's amazing. This is not only one of the greatest books ever written, it's maybe the only one of its kind. It's written by the most powerful man in the world who has no intention of publication. Would probably be mortified that his thoughts on everything from losing his temper to his fear of death would ever be known to people. It's a person who had enormous wealth, enormous fame, and yet he's talking to himself about justice, self-discipline, wisdom, and courage. And the writing is so beautiful so specific and yet so universal at the same time that there's never been a book like it before and there'll probably never be a book like it again. Talking about Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, if you haven't read it, you must. The Stoics wrote for a long time about adversity and difficulty and we take them at their word. What's incredible about this book, it's written by a fighter pilot who shot down over Vietnam. As he is parachuting down, knowing he's gonna be taken prisoner, knowing that he very well could die, this man says to himself, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. What he's doing then is testing the doctrines of Epictetus in a laboratory of human experience. James Stockdale spends seven plus years in what now is called the Hanoi Hilton. He's locked in solitary confinement. He's tortured as Epictetus was and yet all the time he's focusing on what Epictetus talked about, that a podium in a prison is each a place. In any of these situations, good or bad, we have a certain freedom of choice. And what will we do with that choice? Who will we be with that choice? This book by James Bond Stockdale, Medal of Honor recipient, goes on to be an admiral. He's this heroic figure who comforts the other prisoners, who helps steal their will and make them determined and strong. It's called Courage Under Fire. It's an exploration of the Stoics in one of the most difficult circumstances you could possibly imagine. That's why it's worth this very short, very brief, very life-changing read. The author of this book says that everything can be taken from us. And in fact, everything was taken from him. Home, his livelihood, his work, the original manuscript of this book is lost. He loses his entire family in the Holocaust and nearly loses his own life. In Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl says, everything can be taken from us, but our ability to choose our attitude in any set of circumstances to make our own way. This is the essence of Stoicism that we don't control what happens to us. Even something as cruel and awful as the events of the 20th century, we choose how we respond to it. Suffering is in inevitable. We also have the ability to find meaning in suffering, to grow from the suffering. This is one of the most beautiful and inspiring books ever written. There's a reason sold millions and millions of copies. If you haven't read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, you absolutely should. My aunt gave me a copy when I graduated from high school. I've read many times since. One of my absolute favorite books. You have to read it. We all know that we're mortal. We all know that nobody lives forever, and yet we're perpetually caught off guard when 
we lose someone, where even the most stoic amongst us get overwhelmed by grief and sadness and loss. And this is true for the Stoics themselves. Seneca, you know, again, we portray the Stoics as unfeeling and unemotional. Seneca writes three incredibly moving essays on the topic of grief. They're called his consolations. He writes one to his mother, actually has nothing to do with death when he's unjustly exiled. And then he writes two to friends who are grieving someone that they lost. And Seneca is incredibly kind and thoughtful and patient. He totally disproves this notion that the Stoics just stuff their emotions down and saying, no, you should process those emotions, deal with them, try to apply some logic and reason to them. He has this beautiful passage in, in one of them where he's, he's saying like, look, you're grieving your father, but your father loved you. Do you think your father would want his memory to drive you to tears and sadness? No, he would want you to be happy. He would want you to feel good. He would want his memory to bring that emotion out in you. And so this is the kind of stuff that Seneca talks about in his Consolations essays, which until relatively recently could, couldn't be found in one place. I would have to just link people to you know, where they could find them online. But Chicago University Press put out this new edition called Seneca hardship and happiness and it's got a bunch of Seneca's best essays it's got his consolation to Marcia consolation consolation to Helvia that's his mother consolation to Polybus Polybius and then it's also got his essay on the shortness of life which of course touches on the, t the topic of grief grief as well it's got a bunch of other essays from him uh, including one on happiness right the point of stoicism is not to grit your teeth and just grind through life no it's to find happiness and joy despite all the things that are happening so Whenever I know someone that's going through something really tough or difficult, when they're grieving, when they've lost someone or something, this is the book that I tend to point them to. People ask me how I manage to read so much. The answer is, it's my job. That's my secret advantage. I spend a lot of time doing it. I'm on the road right now in a hotel room and I'm spending all my time reading. I realize not everyone has that luxury. What's important though is you get ideas from books. And that's where today's sponsor, Short Form, comes in. Short Form has the world's best summaries of all the bestsellers and classics and nonfiction books you could possibly want to read. They have seven different titles from me on Short Form. So if you've been wanting to check out something from me, maybe that's a good place to start. There's a one page summary of every book and then a deeper dive into all its main points. They've got books on philosophy, productivity, life advice, career advice, business advice, leadership leadership advice, and so much more. There's even a summary of the works of most of the Stoics on there, like Marcus Aurelius. To get a free trial, join Short Form through my special link. That's shortform.com slash daily stoic. And the first 500 of my subscribers to use this link will get 20% off your annual subscription. Or you can just click the link in the description below. Thanks to Short Form for sponsoring this video and for helping make books accessible. The problem with most philosophy books is that they focus on what the philosophers said. This is, of course, all very interesting and can be important, but what really matters is what the philosophers did, who they were, how the ideas were applied to their life. Actually, the Stokes talk about not having much respect for the so-called pen and ink philosophers, just the writers. They were interested in the doers, how they lived up to the ideals. And some of the Stokes did a great job. Marcus Aurelius, he's not corrupted by absolute power. You look at Epictetus surviving slavery and exile and torture. And then there's Stokes like Cicero or Seneca, who wrote very beautifully about the ideas but then failed to live up to them. And that's the premise of Lives of the Stoics, The Art of Living from Zeno to Marcus Aurelius, which I happen to know the author of. As I put together this book, what I was thinking about is really that question. How and when did their actions speak louder than their words? What can we learn from their examples, not just their ideas? This book has a weird title. It's a word you wouldn't recognize. It's a word you don't immediately know how to pronounce. And it translates in a kind of a strange context, but basically it means a defensive weapon. It means at hand. I'm talking about Epictetus's Enchiridion, the handbook, which was seen as a defensive weapon against adversity and difficulty and the blows of fate. This is something that Epictetus would of course know himself quite well. Epictetus is born a slave. He endures incredible adversity and difficulty. He's tortured. He walks with a limp his whole life. He serves in the corrupt, decadent court of Nero and then is eventually exiled. But from all this difficulty and adversity, Epictetus cultivates a life of resilience and strength and fortitude and honor. This is a new translation by Robin Waterfield. It's got all the stuff in here 
But if you haven't read Epictetus, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're not as strong or as well-armed as you could be, so you must read this book. The guy that wrote this book knew a thing about hardships. He's exiled four times. He was in a brutal time to be alive. He's persecuted by tyrants. He saw some of the worst things that people do to each other. And so when he says that we should disdain hardships, this is Musonius Rufus, known as the Roman Socrates. When he says that we should disdain hardships, he's not saying that we should avoid them, we should run away from them. He's saying that we should look at them with a, a sneer or a smirk in the sense that we're better than them, that we're challenged by them, but we don't shy away from this challenge. One of Musonius Rufus's greatest students was Epictetus, who would go on to shape Marcus Aurelius. But his most famous line, uh, it was, was a guy who knew about hardship and he knew about overcoming them. One of his great lines, he said, if you accomplish something good with hard work, the work passes quickly, but the good endures. And then he says, though, if you do something shameful in pursuit of pleasure, you take the easy way out. The result doesn't last long, but the shame endures. And most of all, he said, we earn respect of others, by earning the respect of ourselves by disdaining hardships, by conquering them, by doing the hard work. And that in this little book, which has only recently been retranslated, you learn all about the teachings of one Musonius Rufus, the Roman Socrates, and how this great thinker shaped Epictetus, who in turn has been shaping people for thousands of years since. It really should have been an incomprehensible life, totally foreign way of thinking. The most powerful man in the world, ahead of an enormous army living 2,000 years ago, totally different time with totally different customs. What was his perspective on life? It sort of baffles us. And yet, when you read Marcus Aurelius, you find that there's something very relatable. Despite all the pressures and temptations and everything that he faced, he had a really unique worldview. He thought about things in a way that was both peculiar and unique to his extraordinary circumstances, and then also incredibly applicable for all of us. That's why I love this book by Donald Robert and how to think like a Roman emperor. It's a biography of Marx Aurelius and meditations, but really it's trying to put ourselves in the shoes of this guy, a guy who's worshiped as a god in his own life. You see statues of him all around. He has incredible power, incredible responsibility. He's trying to stay sane in the midst of all that. He survives through it. He's great inside of it. And that's the idea in this book, The Stoic Philosophy of Marx Aurelius by Donald Robinson. I've interviewed him before. He's a great guy. He's really thoughtful and you can tell really loves the subject of the book. So if you're looking to read a book on Stoic philosophy, definitely recommend this one. This is a very short book, but actually makes a pretty controversial argument. It says it isn't that life is short, although it can feel that way, it's that we waste a lot of it. One of the greatest philosophers in the history of the world writes this essay. It's called On the Shortness of Life. But he argues that life doesn't have to be short. Life is long if you know how to use it. That was Seneca's argument. And here in these pages is one of the greatest arguments for the most important thing that you have to grasp, which is that you're here for only a finite amount of time and how you use that time, how you value that time, how you grapple with the fact that you don't know when it's gonna be up, you don't know if you're given a ton of it, just a little bit of it, is one of the most important, pressing philosophical questions. Seneca knows this well because he himself, although he lives to be pretty old, is tragically and violently put to death by the Emperor Nero. Years earlier, he almost died from what we think was tuberculosis. So Seneca's On the Shortness of Life, one of the greatest essays on the human experience ever written. If you haven't read it, absolutely must. This guy said that basically almost all the study of ancient philosophy gets it wrong. That we're thinking about the ideas, we're thinking about the writing, we're thinking about the theory, when in fact what philosophy was was a series of spiritual exercises, notes, discussions with the self about how to solve problems of life. This is Pierre Hedo. He wrote this great book on the meditations of Marcus Aurelius called the Inner Citadel. And he wrote this other book called Philosophy as a Way of Life, which is really drilling down on some of the ideas in this book. He's saying that when Marcus is writing meditations, he's not thinking of you and I at all. He's thinking of himself and the problems he's dealing with in his actual life. Marcus isn't trying to explain all the ideas or the insights of Stoic philosophy. He's trying to work on the very specific parts of Stoic philosophy that he is dealing with. People would say that Marcus really repeats himself too much in meditation or that he's hard on himself. Well, he's hard on himself about the specific things that he's struggling with. Hedo reframes and reimagines meditations as a set of spiritual exercises, philosophy as a way of life. Marcus really wasn't making philosophy for you. He was philosophizing to himself. And I think these are two important Stoic books that everyone should read. 
So where should someone start with the Stoics? That's a tough question, right? Should they read this translation or that translation? Should they read Seneca or Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus, right? It's hard to know where to start. I feel like I got so lucky that I just happened to get the right translation from the right Stoic, Gregory Hayes translation of Meditations off of Amazon at the right time in my life, but maybe I picked up some antiquated translation of Epictetus and my whole trip down this wonderful rabbit hole might have not worked out. So that's actually what I tried to do in this volume. This is the only time and place that all the Stoics, not just the big three, but a number of the lesser known Stoics have been in one book at one time. For eight years ago, we published The Daily Stoic. It's one page a day with one of the best quotes from the Stoics and then a riffing on that quota, an analysis or an explanation, a story that illustrates that idea. When I wrote it, I didn't know how it would do. You know, eight years later, it was sold millions of copies, spent weeks and weeks on the bestseller list be translated in something like 40 languages, but that's the power of Stoicism. All I did was add in an organizational layer that's had this huge impact. And then um, we even have a desk calendar version too, which you can check out. Actually, what's today? I'm a little behind, I was out of the office. Uh, today's the 17th. Do away with opinion that I am harmed and the harm is cast away. Do away with being harmed and harm disappears. Marcus Ruiz is talking about how our perceptions change what's happening to us. And if we don't feel like we've been insulted, hurt, a disadvantage, well, in a sense, we haven't been. So that's the Daily Stoic, which if you're looking for something to start with the Stoics, this might be helpful to you. I hope you like this video. I hope you subscribe. But what I really want you to subscribe to is our Daily Stoic email, one bit of Stoic wisdom, totally for free to the largest community of Stoics ever in existence. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash email. There's no spam. You can unsubscribe at any time. I love sending it. I've sent it every day for the last six years. And I hope to see you there at dailystoic.com slash email.